testing. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, ciao. <laughs> My name is Brad Newberg. I work with Google. And I just wanted to start by saying it's a real honor to be here. I've always wanted to come to Milan. So I got to see the Il Duomo over the weekend. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, it's really beautiful. And it's really great to get to meet all of you and learn about your local tech scene. <coughs> So um, before we jump in, I kind of want to just get a sense of the audience. So who, who here programs in JavaScript as, as their main language? Kind of. Who here codes with Java as their main language? Who here codes in PHP? OK. How about C or C++? How about something else? Python? Yeah, Python, sorry. <laughs> Python, wonderful language, sorry. I'm going to get beat, beat up after the, after the talk. Um, great, great. And um, who here is from Italy? That's an easy question. Not everyone. Wow. <laughs> right on. So great. So uh, sorry, I wanted to just put a, a Star Wars lightsaber sound somewhere in the talk. And that was one place. So now uh, I know a little bit better about who you are. So who is this guy who's up on stage talking for a while? I just kind of want to tell you about my background and, and what you can blame me for. So uh, I'm an Ajax person. Uh, my motto is I like to get web browsers to do things they weren't really designed to do. Um, I'm a JavaScript person, and a Java person, and some Python. And uh, I'm active in an open source project called Dojo. Who's, who here has heard of Dojo? OK. Uh, I created something called Dojo Storage and Dojo Offline, and a library called Really Simple History. So if you use those, you can blame me. You can file your bugs and put my name. Uh, I'm a member of the Gears team. So I get out to conferences, educate, help do open source for Gears. Uh, I helped create something called co-working. Um, I work for Google now, but I worked for myself for a long time. And co-working is this grassroots movement that if you work for yourself, you can have community. I know there's a number of people in Milan that are interested in this, this idea. And I'm a member of a new team at Google called the Open Web Advocacy Team. And our job is to get out and educate about new web technologies, help to accelerate the web, to help make web browsers better, even faster. So I want to jump right in, and I want to show you demos. And I'll explain to you what the open web is. But these are things that you can do with the web today, cross-browser, that you may not have expected. On the upper left, you see graphing happening, happening with data coming real time from a server. On the right, you see a large data grids with lots of data. Again, this works Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari. At the bottom, you see graphics happening and animation using open web technologies. One thing I forgot to mention, if, if, I'm, if I'm talking too fast or if uh, I say something you don't understand, please raise your hand and, and, and ask me to say it again. So other things that you can do today with the open web you may not expect, this is Yahoo Pipes. This works cross-browser, an advanced user interface. You can connect these different uh, data together to do advanced things, all built using open web technologies, cross-browser. This is uh, Zoho DB. Um, again, open web technologies. You see we've got a graph. We have data points. You can click in and open up uh, spreadsheets. Again, all these are technologies that you can use in your own projects, browser-based. This is the Apple Store. You might expect that this is built with something else. 
Everything here is built with open web technologies, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, we'll be talking about those. Um, and you can zoom into what you might purchase. You can see it from various angles. So I just want to show you that today, you know, we've, we've had promises about what the web can do. You can do more with the web today than you'd expect. This is, of course, Google Docs. Using open web technologies, you can take things offline using gears. Here we are being able to take our documents offline, being able to work away from the network. So that was just sort of a, a touch of things that you can do today that you may not have expected cross-browser using open web tech. But one of the common questions is, what is the open web? So who here has heard of this term, open web? It's, it's a newer term that's just starting to get out there. And um, so what is the open web? And in general, it's, it's what we've been working with, but we haven't given it a great name. And, and that's made it hard to talk about the technologies that we're using and, and the principles behind these technologies that are really important for our businesses and for what we do. So what is the open web? I'm going to give you five things that make the open web. One of the first ones is cross-platform standards. So by cross-platform, that means these run on the Macintosh, Windows, mobile phones. And by standards, it doesn't mean some big official thing. It's just a description, a piece of paper or an online document that says, here's how this thing is built. You can go and see how HTML is built, for example. The open web means open source implementations. Not everything, but at least one. That's a big aspect of the open web. You have Mozilla. You have Google Chrome. These are open source implementations. That's important for the open web. A really important aspect of the open web is no lock-in, no vendor lock-in. Multiple people contribute, and there's not just one company that controls the whole thing. A really important aspect of the open web is that anyone can innovate. Whether you're in a garage, whether you're in a big company, a small company, you can contribute to evolve the web itself. And I love this. This is a, a drawing from a patent diagram. Uh, that's actually a suit to protect you from sharks. So these ideas don't have to be good ideas, <laughs> but anyone can contribute. I don't know how well that one works. I don't want to volunteer to try it out. And the fifth aspect of the open web is universal, powerful clients. In general, these are web browsers. So the open web is all about making browsers more powerful, more stable, faster, so we can do more on the web. So as a small footnote, those are the, like, the main five things of the open web. And there's a little footnote of these are things that are important. They don't, they're not always true, but the open web tends to, to have these characteristics. The open web is mashable. What does that mean? That means I can take data from two different websites and put it together. Not always, but generally. Hyperlinks mean that I can point deeply into things. So it's like mashing up. It kind of comes from mashed potatoes, right? The open web is searchable. Generally, I can crack things open, and I get text formats, like HTML, that I can run through a search engine. And finally, the open web is integrated. So HTML, JavaScript, CSS, these work together. They're not a black box. They're not by themselves. So are there any questions, just before I jump forward, about what the open web is? OK. So why should you care? Like, well, OK, you've heard what this open web thing is. OK, fine. Like, uh, yeah. um, why should you care? Well, there's two kinds of people. There are people that are more idealistic and pragmatic. Most people are a mix of both. I'm a little more idealistic. So I'm going to have different reasons. I'm going to kind of pull you over and sell, t say different reasons for these two kinds of people. And I love the idealist. It's sort of like uh, <laughs> magic flying unicorns, you know. I'm more like idealist. And the, um, the pragmatist 
just wants to get things done, right? So for the idealist, um, and the pragmatist is, is going to just say, ah, who cares about that? But for the idealist, here's why the open web matters. When the future looks back to today, one of the things that will be in the history books is the web and the internet. We are so lucky to be present at the birth of something that can really change things. And as computer scientists, it's our opportunity and our responsibility to keep that evolving, keep that open, so that we can continue doing interesting, powerful things. It's really amazing that, that we all live now and get to help define what the web is. So I like to say it's like the library of Alexandria has landed on our laps, and we get to decide what we're going to do with that. For the pragmatists, they're like, ah, okay, big, big ideas. For, for the pragmatists, the open web matters because it, it's safe. When I say open web, that's just a fancy term for HTML, JavaScript, CSS. It's what you've already been doing in the web browser. Most likely, you've been building websites and web applications using these technologies. So the open web matters to you because you want that to continue to evolve so you can make your applications more and more powerful. Because you don't want to have to throw away everything you've done to replace it with some new thing five years from now if, if the web doesn't evolve. And also, if you're a developer, the open web is in your interest because those skills you can use everywhere. You're not learning a system that only is over here. Almost everyone uses the web. So if you're pragmatic, that's, that's a good reason there. So why does Google care? I mean, I'll be completely transparent with you. You know, you might be, why is there someone up here from Google talking about the open web? You know, what are, you know, what, what, what's, what's going on? What are, what are our motivations? So here is, here is our motivation completely transparent to you. So the more users that we can get on the web, and the better we can make web browsers, the better we can make web browsers, <coughs> the more searching will happen, right? Users will have more relevant results. There'll be more searching. There'll be more advertisements. And we'll be able to make better applications, like Google Docs, taking it offline, making it faster. And this leads to money. I'm sorry, I'm Italy. Money. <laughs> now, what's great, uh, one of the reasons I love working for Google is we try to find things where we can do the right thing and have a good business. So there's a term, enlightened self-interest. So it's not just about making money. We're interested on, in keeping the web open and evolving because that's the right thing to do. And it also turns out to be good for our business and good for your business. So that's a really nice place to be in. So, so that's why there's someone from Google up here that flew out you know, from far away to talk to you about this. So that's our motivation. So when, as you go out through today, you're going to see lots of presentations. And you might ask, how does the open web fit into gears? How does it fit into open social? And I just want to talk about how this commitment to the open web underlies everything that we're doing in terms of our, our Google, the Google technologies that we're developing. So. Things like Google Gears, how does that have to do with the open web? Well, Gears is an open source browser plugin that gives web browsers new tricks, new features. And it helps solve the open web problem of actually getting new things into current web browsers. Because it takes a long time today. And that will hurt the open web if we don't solve that. So Gears helps to address that issue. How does Google Chrome fit into the open web? Well, Chrome is all about making a browser that can help web applications, not just websites. So for the open web to evolve, we want to be able to make more powerful applications, and Chrome helps with that. It also helps with getting web standards out there. Android, this is the open source mobile operating system. What does this have to do with the open web? Well, Android is all about making it easier to develop 
for the mobile web and the mobile world, making it simpler, making it open. So Android fits into that vision with its open source mobile operating system. Open social, um, which is a way to help bring the social, to help bring socialness to the web. Open social is all, all about helping to solve the open web issue of actually bringing people into the web in an open way. So you'll see there's, there's other things like G data that I, that I can't, I don't have time to talk about how open web fits into it. But you'll see that the open web is underneath everything we're doing, including the open web advocacy group, which I love. I can't believe that, that Google helps fund the, the, our team to come out here and help keep the web open and help to create open source JavaScript that helps keep the web open and makes it more featureful. So I love it. Um, and so Google's really committed to that. So I want to briefly touch on the agenda for today. So now you've heard what the open web is and why it matters. The agenda is I'm going to give um, these little lightning talks, these little report cards on different aspects of the open web and how they're doing. And the web has become so big that I can't talk about everything and we'd be here for hours. Um, so I'll just cherry pick. I'll just take little bits and sort of talk about them. Interesting new things. And you'll find that you can do more today than you, than you realized. So the agenda for each of these, like vector graphics, I'll first give you an introduction to what is it. What, what is in vector graphics? What is the canvas tag? Then I'll give you a browser demo. This is like dance, monkey, dance, sort of make the, make the browser dance. You'll get to see that technology working in different web browsers so that it's real. Then we'll talk about web browser. Uh, you'll get a code snippet. So you'll actually see this technology being used. And then you'll, we'll talk about uh, browser compatibility. You know, you may have felt like this, right, when you're trying to figure out what'll work where. So I'll give you a report card on, you know, where this technology can be used, and then there'll be a final stamp. Is, is this ready? Is this not ready? Is it almost ready? And then we'll talk about JavaScript shims. And I'll explain what those are. They're a painful reality of today's web, but they're these libraries you can drop into your page, built with JavaScript, that can trick older browsers into being newer. And they're really one of the key ways that we can do things on the web that you didn't think you could do. So for each of these, we'll talk about what are your JavaScript shims. And I'll explain a little more what those are when we get to that. So let's jump into the first one, vector graphics. And, and before I tell you the technologies behind those, people might be, what, what are vector graphics? Well, vector graphics is a way to, to describe what you see on your screen using mathematical equations. This is in contrast to raster, gra raster graphics, like GIF, JPEG, PING, which are arrays of pixels. And the easiest way to illustrate this is with an image. So here we see a drawing of, of, a, of a bottle. If we zoomed in for vector graphics, it stays beautiful. It stays, it's, it stays um, uh, legible. But on the bottom, if you're uh, uh, bitmap graphics, uh, raster graphics, it, it pixelates, it breaks apart. And this starts to matter because users want more beautiful user interfaces now. They're on big screens. They're on tiny screens on mobile devices. So we're seeing more and more vector graphics. So there's two way to do vector graphics using open web technology today. The first is the canvas tag. And the second is scalable vector graphics, SVG. So who here's heard of the canvas tag? Oh, great. So we're going to get to introduce. Who here's heard of SVG? Oh, right on. OK. So let's jump into the Canvas tag first. What is it? Well, it's an HTML tag that you can drop into your page. And then it's an API that you can access through JavaScript to draw things on the page. And let's jump right in with a demo. This right here is all built using the Canvas tag. This is Safari 3. And you see, this is Firefox 3, the same thing running. You see it looks the same all open web technologies. And then here's the surprising thing. Here's Internet Explorer running the same thing. 
Look at that. We can draw using the canvas tag. This is uh, IE7, all right? And you'll, you'll, you'll find out why you can do this. Uh, and the last one was uh, Firefox 3. So let's look at a code example. So I, I said there's an HTML tag, so there we go. We drop that into our page. And then with our JavaScript, we grab a reference to the canvas. And then you get what's called a context. You get a drawing surface. And then you just call methods. So here we are, we set a fill style, so we're, we're changing the color. And then we're drawing a rectangle at that x position, that y position, and that width and height. So super straightforward. And the Canvas API has a bunch of methods like this to draw lines and paths, change the stroke, change the color. Okay, look, now we're at our first report card. This is the, uh, so the, the Edward Munch you know, thing. So where, where does this stand? And you're going to see this. For every one of these technologies, we'll talk about where we stand and what's usable. So Firefox 2, Firefox 3, Safari 3, Canvas is supported there. Chrome and iPhone, Canvas is supported there. You see Internet Explorer 6, 7, and 8. There's actually no native support, but... There's a JavaScript shim that you can drop into your web page and tricks it into supporting the Canvas tag. And I'll talk about this. You have to be aware of performance. But if you're careful, you can do some really cool things, which you just saw. Yes, you had a question? And, uh, what about the Opera browser? So the question is, what about the Opera browser? So I love Opera. They support the web standards better than anyone else. Um, to keep this from being really, really long, I didn't include Opera. But in general, for, for almost all of these, you can just assume Opera supports it. Uh, oh, because it is very common on mobile phones. Opera. So the, 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 the comment was uh, Opera Mini is very common on mobile phones. You're right. Uh, on Windows Mobile, Opera Mini is very strong. In general, I fo I'm focusing a little bit more on the desktop browsers. Um, mobile browsing is a big subject unto itself. So. The canvas tag, is this not ready? Is this almost ready? Or is this ready for you to use today? This is ready. Um, a lot of this talk is about rather than, hey, someday in the future you can do this, it'll be about what can you do today? And being able to work cross-browser is the reality of whether you can do something today. The canvas tag is ready to use, especially because of the shim that was created. And I'll talk about that. So this is something that you should definitely begin learning about. Um, you can do amazing things with it. You can uh, you know, really do cross-browser, cross-platform vector graphics. Yes? It's a great question. Who did the, the shim? Um, so Emil Eklund kicked it off. Uh, Google has helped develop this. Um, it's hosted at code.google.com with other open source projects. Um, it's open source. Under the covers, it uses something called VML, Vector Markup Language, which is an older proprietary drawing standard that's been in IE since IE5. Um, be careful of performance. As you develop, always test. But if you walk the right path, you can do really good stuff. There's the, ad um, there's the address. I think it's also on SourceForge. I think they have links to each other. Um, so this one right here is just, this is so great work. Uh, and you'll see that over and over again. Are there any questions about what a JavaScript shim is? Some people haven't heard of that before. Is that clear? OK. You don't know. OK. Um, so when you have a browser that doesn't support something, like the canvas tag, um, remember I said like, that I like to help get web browsers to do things that they weren't designed to do? <laughs> so JavaScript shims are how you do that. So in, when you write your web page, you include a JavaScript library that looks like the technology, but under the covers, it may be doing other things to be able to do that. So in, in this one, it looks like the canvas tag, and you can use the standard. But under the covers, it uses 
proprietary features of Internet Explorer to do the drawing. But at the end of the day, you don't need any plugins, you don't need anything extra, and they're generally open source. So they're a great thing to have in your, in your toolkit. All right, so you've seen the Canvas tag. What about SVG? Um, you're going to be really surprised about SVG. That's one of those things that hasn't been ready for a long time. Right? Um, but what is it? SVG is a markup language for graphics. So by a markup language, I mean just like when you do HTML, you can drop a form tag in, a button tag. SVG, give, SVG gives you a circle tag, a rectangle tag. And you can just drop that into your page. Um, let's directly look at a demo. So this is Safari 3. This is all about using SVG. These images are being scaled, they're being rotated. And then we jump over to Firefox 3, all built with SVG, rounded corners. What does this look like? Well, remember I said it was a tag, so in your HTML, you drop in a container with the SVG tag. And then you give those tags. So there's a rectangle, 60 by 60, 0, 0. And we're making the stroke, the outside, green. So super straightforward. So whereas Canvas is a JavaScript API, SVG is sort of a markup type system. So where do we, where do we stand with SVG? What's the report card? So something really interesting has happened the last year. SVG has silently entered into almost every web browser. Uh, Firefox 2 supports it. Firefox 3 is even better at it. Safari 3 is really strong. Opera is amazing at it, actually. They're very strong. Um, Chrome has it. The, the very latest version of the iPhone, the very latest, has SVG support. But IE Internet Explorer doesn't support SVG. Um, what this means is that currently, SVG is not ready to use. But I think we're about to turn the corner. And what we need is a shim. As you'll see over and over and over again, if you have a JavaScript shim, you can accelerate by several years sometime what you can achieve. So there's not one yet for Internet Explorer. But if we get one, then we'll really start to be able to use a baseline of SVG across a lot of browsers. Um, I'm working with the, with the Open Web Advocacy Group to create a JavaScript shim for Internet Explorer that gets SVG working on IE and actually makes it a first-class citizen. And I'll show you a demo. I just want to uh, iterate that um, this is not done yet. It might take a while to finish. But I wanted to give you a sneak peek at this because once we have something like this, then we can really start to use SVG. You're looking at Internet Explorer 7 here. This is the SVG shim running. That is an SVG inline. That is SVG being scripted by JavaScript. If you look at, this is the developer toolbar. If you look inside the page, it looks real. You see it in the DOM, document object model. Here we are, these, uh, these bouncing balls, again, created with SVG, dynamically, Internet Explorer. Under the covers, it's actually using Flash but you don't see that. And because Flash is on 97% of the installed base, this is a valid way to get support for SVG. So I just want to give you a sneak peek of this. So when this starts showing up, these kinds of things, you can start adding SVG to your toolbox, your toolkit. So I just want to briefly say, a lot of times you get, you know, I love Canvas, I love SVG, you know, you know and they fight. Um, you actually need both. They're different. I don't have time to completely explain, but Canvas is what's, what's known as an immediate mode API. It's like drawing on a, on, a, on a canvas. I draw, and then it loses whatever you just drew. It just becomes part of the, the surface. SVG is what's known as retained mode. So when I make a circle, I make a rectangle, it's held in a tree. So it still knows it's a circle. It still knows it's a square. So that's really useful for putting event listeners, building user interfaces. So Canvas is, is good for things like games and decorations, whereas SVG is very good for building user interfaces. So we need both. 
And the good news is Canvas is there, and SVG is almost there. So how many people realized that Canvas and SVG were stronger on the open web than you than you'd expected? Right? I mean, I yeah, exactly. I thought these, you know, did you know you can do drawing like this on the open web? So jumping to another report card, Ajax history and bookmarking. What is this? Well, let me first ask, who here in the audience builds Ajax applications? Okay. Um, when you build an Ajax application, what you find is it starts messing with how the web browser is supposed to work, right? You start playing around and bookmarks don't work. Another thing is the back and the forward button breaks as well. So I hit the back button and even though I've done five things in my Ajax app, the whole thing breaks and it jumps to the previous page. And it's really important to have your app work how the user expects it to work. So this is something that's important to solve. Uh, I want to show you a quick demo. This is Internet Explorer 8. It's the beta. It has native support for, for something called HTML5 history. So up there, maybe a little small, you see an anchor. And when we click these links, the anchor changes. And HTML5 gives us a way to know when the history has changed. And you see it being printed out there. And so when the back of the forward button changes, or the user bookmarks, you have a, a, a listener, a JavaScript listener to know, and then you can update your application. And I'll be talking more about HTML5 if you haven't heard of that before. It's another really exciting development. Here's what this kind of code looks like. This is actually using the HTML5 history standard. On your body tag, there's a new listener on hash change, right? There's the hash for the location. And then you have a function that gets called. So whenever that gets updated with the back of the forward button, we can find out the new location. And you can imagine putting your application code in there to change your user interface based on whatever the new location is. So where are we at? So here's what's great. Um, uh, Ajax history, even though these are all yellow, um, because of shims, you can do this cross-browser on every single browser. So uh, all the ones that are yellow, they require a JavaScript shim. Okay. And it's not the HTML5 API, which I'll talk about, which means there's native support. The only one that has that is IE8. They've really taken a leadership stance here, and they've been the first to natively support Ajax history and bookmarking, which is really nice. Um, so this is something, this is ready to use. You should be using this. It's good usability, it's good for your users, and uh, the technology is there. Uh, I just want to give you a list of some Ajax history bookmarking shims. You should be using one of these if you want to support it because this is how you do it. These are three great choices. DS history uh, is a really strong choice. The YUI browser history manager, this is a part of Yahoo's JavaScript library, which is really well done. Uh, really simple history, it's a project I was involved in. It's another nice choice. So you've gotten to see that little, little state of the open web. What about JavaScript toolkits? What, what's the state of JavaScript toolkits on the open web? Well, this is one of the real strengths of the open web. I like to say, um, how do you choose an Ajax framework? There's only, almost too many choices. These are a bunch of popular, different uh, JavaScript Ajax libraries. Um, in the last year, we've really seen these libraries converging into four choices. So jQuery, Dojo, Gwit for the Java crowd, and Prototype. Um, and one thing I would say, in, in 2008, almost 2009, if you're not using a JavaScript toolkit, you should be. These are all great choices. So traditionally, in about 2007, the old taxonomy, the old way that people saw these toolkits was that Prototype, does, has, has everyone heard of Prototype? Yeah. Um, that this is the one you use when you want a really lightweight library, right, little helpers. Traditionally, GWT was for, hey, you hate JavaScript? Use Java. Uh, jQuery was the new kid on the block that had a very DOM-centric, which meant you would have methods that would iterate over what you see on the screen very fast. And then traditionally, Dojo was seen as the sort of complete soup to nuts Ajax solution, that it had everything, but that it was big. 
We've really seen in 2008 the situation's changed. All the toolkits have really come together. So Prototype, jQuery, Dojo Core, they all now have a very small core library that you can drop into your page, no questions asked. Uh, one of the strengths of Dojo used to be that it had a very strong extension community. But now, all the, these major toolkits have very strong extension communities. Uh, Prototype has a community with lots of good stuff. jQuery has a very strong plugin community. And Dojo has Dojo X. So you get this really small core if you want it. But then there's all sorts of cool uh, uh, icing on the cake that won't bloat your code size, but they're there if you need them. And all the toolkits have this now. And really, they all have really good user interface options now, too. It used to be the jQuery didn't have UI widgets, but now there's some really good ones. Dojo has Digit, and uh, Prototype has always had Scriptaculous, which is a great option for cool animations. So they all pretty much have that. So at, at this point, the JavaScript toolkits have pretty much reached parity and almost the same philosophy. And this is something that's ready. It, I mean, JavaScript toolkits have been very strong the last two years. Um, the, the amount of productivity you can save for not having to get around cross-browser bugs using one of these is very strong. Uh, if you find yourself rolling your own toolkit for your project, don't. I know it's fun to, to roll your own stuff, but these have become so strong. It's community, and all of them have books as well and great educational resources. This is one of the real strengths of the open web is, is, are these JavaScript toolkits. Yes? What do I think of XJS? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Is that the PHP? No, There's so many toolkits. Yeah. Personally, I think there's a lot of interesting approaches from all the toolkits. But I think things that converged on this, including YUI, is another nice choice. So I, I wouldn't use a toolkit other than these four and YUI. Any other questions? I don't understand. So, so the question is, what do I think about integration between Java and JavaScript? Um, so if you're working with Java, GWT is a great solution. And um, the work in the last few years in Java around hosting scripting languages is really strong. So you can run JavaScript on the server side, JRuby, uh, Python. Uh, so that, that work has come along well. Um, there's integration technologies between Java and JavaScript in the browser. It's called Live Connect. It's been there for many years. It can be quite buggy. Um, I wouldn't recommend it these days. So, so web fonts. Again, this is another one of those things we've been hearing about for years. Since 1997, people have been talking about web fonts. And what is this? This is advanced typography for the web. This is beautiful text. So you don't have to always generate images for all your text. I'm going to jump right in with a demo. This is Safari 3. So this is, um, um, let's start that over. So this is uh, Safari 3. This is Dojo GFX, which is another drawing library. And it has something called Dojo Fonts. And those fonts are all drawn with that. And that allows you to do cross-browser fonts. This is also built with, that, built with that. This is IE7. And so those fonts are generated through Dojo GFX fonts. So having custom fonts, that's actually uh, vector image as well, um, all built with open web technologies. Here we are in Safari 3, looking at the same demo, seeing the same kind of fonts, also work in Firefox 3. Dojo GFX fonts came out a few months ago, and it's really shifted the situation. Um, as you'll see, the underlying technologies behind web fonts is very fragmented. Um, Internet Explorer has supported something called Embedded Open Type for a long time, but they're the only ones that do. Safari 3 has really taken a, le taken a leadership stand, 
and they're supporting true type fonts, which is one of the industry standards. Um, and Firefox 3.1 is also moving towards supporting this. Then there's something called SVG fonts, which I consider the dark horse. Um, Do Dojo GFX fonts actually is able to support the cross-browser fonts by internally being like SVG fonts. It's really clever. Uh, but right now, those are only natively supported on Safari 3 and Firefox 3.1. Here's an example of, uh, of using CSS. This is what it looks like. You give a font face directive, you give a name to your font, and then you give a link to the true type file or the embedded open type file, and you give the type. And then in your CSS, when you want to use it, here we are with an H1 element, and we're saying, use the Kimberly font. If it's not there, degrade to a sans serif. So what's the report card? Well, this is one of those really surprising ones. Um, Dojo GFX fonts has really shifted the conversation about, uh, about web fonts. Um, and uh, because of its existence, we now have a shim that Firefox 2, Firefox 3, Safari 3, IE, and Chrome, you can do cross-browser web fonts. It's, you know, it's not the easiest thing, but it's much easier than it's been. Um, natively, Safari 3.1 rules the roost. They support the true type fonts. They support the SVG fonts. And what's really exciting is Safari and Firefox and, of course, Chrome, um, they all have a great conversation with each other, so they're all evolving this. Um, for Internet Explorer, I said they had their own proprietary thing. The shim can be a little glitchy, but if you test well and you find a good path, you can do good stuff. So the question is, is this ready? This is almost ready. So what that means is that shim has really transformed things. You should begin to prototype this, experiment with it. Um, you can get solutions going. It's definitely something to put on your radar to begin learning and using. Um, we talked about the, really today you need to use a shim, and that Dojo GFX fonts is a great solution for that. You can grab that. This is a link to uh, a, a good blog post that describes it. There's another technique called Cipher. I don't have time to explain it, but it actually uses Flash uh, in a way that's unobtrusive. It's clever. Uh, it's a little hard to use, but it's been around for several years. So if you want web fonts, that's a great way to do it. I want to just give you a taste of the future. This is Safari 3. Um, these are all free web fonts. They're not the most beautiful web fonts, but there's 10 free fonts. And you're seeing this is natively supported. And of course, if I took my cursor and selected the text, it would select, works on the clipboard. Um, so it'll be really nice when we have nat cross-browser native support. And, and we're, we're getting there. But today, that shim can get you quite far. So here we are. And of course, it integrates. Remember I talked about integration? So when you run the mouse over, it's changing the text. And it just did that with some CSS, like a, the hover directive on the text. Um, so it's a first-class citizen. That's really nice. So I want to talk to you about the state of CSS, cascading style sheets. We all, you know, the, the standard we, we, we all love and hate at the same time, right? It's a great way to, to style your pages. It's a big subject, so I just kind of want to give you a touch of where things are going and where things are now. Uh, I'll talk about something called CSS animations, reflections, and masks. This is a really cool thing that Safari's been pushing forward. It lets you do pretty advanced graphics with just some CSS. I'll talk about CSS 2.1. What's the state of that? Well, CSS 1 is great. You can use it everywhere. Why do you care about CSS 2.1? Well, it gives you a couple new selectors. These are those things that when you do your, your CSS, that it'll bind the things on your page. And uh, it gives you some nice thing around pushing content into the page. And then there's CSS3. Why do you care about that? Well, that gives you more selectors, and it lets you do multi-column layout. Which, if you've, who, who's ever done, tried to make multiple columns with CSS today? It's hard, right? The CSS3 gives you some nice little keywords that you can make multiple columns. So it's really nice when we get that. This is actually a demo of Safari 3. This is the CSS animation, CSS effects. So that's all done with CSS. So when you hover over it, uh, when that's clicked, so when it hovers over it, so really changing the visual look. 
This is, um, again, Safari 3. There's a CSS reflection. You just take the image, throw a CSS reflection on it. You can do masking. Take one image and mask it. Here's a, you can do shadows. So, so that's doing a, a mask with a gradient. Here we are again doing a gradient. Oh, that's right, so there's gradient support. Uh, and Safari has cool integration with SVG, so that's using an SVG image, a circle, masking an image. Again, using the CSS directive. So these are really cool. This is some of the most exciting work in CSS. Here's a CSS 2.1 example. So let's say I've got a div with a custom attribute. My attribute equals hello. Here's a 2.1 selector. So this rule will get matched if the my attribute equals hello, and it'll change the background color to blue. As you'll see, white custom attributes, that starts to become important when you want to style XML using CSS, which is, uh, we'll touch on that for a second. So what's the report card? Where are we at? CSS effects is not ready, unfortunately. It's really cool. Uh, it's currently only supported with Safari 3. Firefox 3.1 is starting to bring it on. CSS 2.1 is ready. Um, IE 8 completely will support that standard. IE 7 supports a lot of it. Um, IE 6 supports some. So every version of IE has gotten better and better and better, and IE 8 will fully support the standard. CSS 3, unfortunately, is not ready. Uh, there's some support in Safari 3 and Firefox 3, but IE 8 will not support it. So that's too bad. We're still going to have to use these tricks to do multiple columns in CSS, but we'll get there. Who here's heard of HTML5? Okay. That's Ian Hixey right there. He helped kick this off. Um, HTML5 is the next revision of HTML. So today we have HTML4. And HTML5 is all about let's evolve the language. Let's make it more powerful. It's actually in two parts. The first part documents how the web currently works. So Ian's done some really cool work of taking the Google search index and scanning over it and seeing what features are people actually using? What are real mistakes that people are, ma are making? Um, and also studying, let's really document how HTML works. So if you want to write a new web browser, you can literally just read the spec and it will work how it actually works, not how it's supposed to work. The second part adds a bunch of new features to HTML. And some of these are, there's a bunch of them. So the canvas tag is in there. Um, talking about how to embed SVG that's being planned, client-side storage, offline, editing, all these things, and a pony. There's lots of cool new features in HTML5. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not ready yet. What's nice, though, is um, Ian's very pragmatic. Um, so browsers are cherry-picking little features. They're showing up. IE8 has some. Firefox 3, Firefox 2. So um, these things are showing up. And a lot of the functionality can be done today with JavaScript shims. So jumping to another little report card, the XML web. A lot of people have forgotten about this. Right? What was this? This was supposed to be an integrated set of technologies based on XML that could work inside the browser. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that most people don't realize that parts of this have been more successful than you'd expect. There's more that you can do with this than you'd like, uh, than you'd like, than you, than you know. Um, so what's the report card? It's hard to give a demo of this because it's, you know, it's more a programmer technology. Um, so XML. You might be surprised, but you can get an XML parser in all of the major browsers. You can push XML from your server, to the client, parse it, run over it to build up a user interface. That's ready. That's very strong. XSLT, what is this? This is a way to take some XML and transform it into something else, generally turning it into HTML so you can display it. So you could have, let's say you, you have some XML that represents a customer. You could just make a little XSLT script that turns it into HTML and displays it on the page. Um, most people don't realize this is very ready, very strong. Every browser supports XSLT, Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox. So you can do some very cool things in there. Do you have a question? Okay. XPath. 
What is that? These are these expressions that you can use to match parts of an XML document. They're really, really cool when, when you got them. You can just sort of say, give me just that. They're much better than doing the DOM, which can get very tedious. These are very well supported cross-browser. Um, Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox again, Chrome, iPhone. CSS XML, what is this? So let's say you want to directly give the user some XML and display it. Well, you may not realize that you can actually attach cascading style sheets to your XML. So you actually can say, this employee tag, display it as a block, put a square around it, and so on. So you can do really amazing things. Firefox supports it, Safari supports it. Unfortunately, IE doesn't support it, but it's almost ready. It's getting better. I believe IE8 is going to have a little more support. Uh, so this is something to keep an eye on. And of course, there's XHTML, which um, is basically HTML rewritten to be like XML. This is not ready. Um, again, Firefox, Safari, th their support for XHTML is very strong, but Internet Explorer's is not. And in general, XHTML has been more strong on the server side to store things. So that's one thing that's just not there. And so, um, but in general, the XML web is stronger than folks have expected. And you may not use these technologies all the time, but when you need them, they're very powerful. Any questions about some of that material I talked about? Yes? Will the slides be available somewhere? What's that? Uh, they should be, and if, the, and, and if they're not, I'll do that. <laughs> so the question is, will the slides be available? Any other questions? I'm sorry, the performance of what? Oh, the performance. Um, so XPath is very fast on some of the browsers as is XSLT. Um, you know, you always have to be aware of performance in the browser. Uh, it can be a really fast way to do some operations, which is why it's a very powerful tool. Um, if you use it naively, it can be slow. That's true of any browser technology. But it can be very fast. All right, so video on the web. This is one of the things I'm really excited about. This is a part of HTML5. It's a tag that you can drop videos onto your web page. I just want to start with a demo. This is Wikipedia. This is an Opera, uh, eight, or Opera 9 experimental. So that's using the video tag. Integrated right into the page. What's so cool is that it's integrated. So this is actually SVG video. And you're seeing a video being displayed. You're seeing a mask go over it. You're seeing a shadow. And then you can even select the text. So that's what's so cool. It's integrated into the browser, so you can play it, you know, integrate it with the other stuff that's there. What does this look like? Here's the HTML5 video tag. You just say the video tag, give a source, give it an ID. And then in your JavaScript, get a reference, and you have methods like play, pause, stop. We can set it to be muted. And check that out. Look, you can make uh, JavaScript callbacks that get called when different parts of the video are entered or exited. So you can queue, so you could do this for closed captioning, you could integrate other parts of your page, you could have real-time chat. So again, it's integrated. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> it's not ready. Um, but Firefox 3.1 and Safari 3.1 will support it. And, uh, but it's not ready today. But it's one of those things that's just it's really cool. And uh, it's one of the parts of HTML5 I'm really excited about. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, this is something to keep an eye on, but you can't use it today yet. So I said the open web is so big. There's so much going on. We could be here forever. I want to just, I'm just going to touch, just sort of lightning, on some other cool features of the open web and where they stand and whether you can use them today or not. So the first one is client-side storage. And what this is is the ability to store data in the browser that lives when you close the browser, hundreds of K or megabytes when the user gives you permission. Why do you want that? That can help with performance. It can help with latency. 
You can cache commonly used data. Um, it can also help for offline. Surprisingly enough, you'll be, uh, that's ready. You can do that on all the major browsers. And how does that work? Well, you use a JavaScript shim, like Dojo Storage, or you use a plugin like Gears. But you can start using client-side storage. How about offline? Uh, and by the way, and, and of course, HTML5 will natively have that in HTML, but that's not natively supported yet by other browsers. Offline is also ready to do today, and again, using uh, something like Gears, which is a, a small open source plugin. Um, so you're already starting to see apps like Zoho, um, uh, different Google applications going offline using that. How about cross domain? What is this? If you want to safely and securely and fast have two domains talk to each other, it's hard to do that on the web today. Um, but this is ready to really do with something called JSONP. I don't have a lot of time to explain it, but it's a really interesting technique. Uh, if, you, if you need to have advanced communication, uh, check out JSONP. It's a, it's a technique. How about fast JavaScript? Um, one of the really powerful things in the last year has been the work on getting JavaScript to be really, really fast. Faster than you'd expect. So V8 uh, in Chrome is doing cool stuff there. Um, Trace Monkey in Firefox. Um, Safari has a really interesting work there as well. Unfortunately, we're almost there. Because in the next generation of all those browsers, we're going to have really fast JavaScript. But unfortunately, Internet Explorer, they don't have on the horizon fast JavaScript. So we're almost there. But what's great about that is it's degradable. So users that have these fast JavaScript VMs, I think it's going to really redefine our expectations of what JavaScript can do. It's pretty amazing. And if you go to the Chrome talk, you'll see some, some, uh, some mention of these kinds of things. But all, all of, the, of the browsers are doing this. How about JavaScript++? Plus plus? Yes. Yes, it's a great question. So the, the question is, isn't the real bottleneck the DOM? And you're right. The real bottleneck is the DOM. Uh, most of the time, we're, we're DOM constrained versus compute constrained. Um, and I believe that Mozilla Firefox is doing some interesting work around lessening that as a bottleneck. But you're right. Um, for the other browsers, this doesn't necessarily satisfy that bottleneck. JavaScript++, this is the name I give to work that's being done to evolve JavaScript as a language. Um, as we know, you can do software engineering with JavaScript, but it doesn't have the best support for programming in the large. You can do it, but you know you have to kind of know what you're doing. JavaScript++ goes by the names like ECMAScript 3.1 or ECMAScript 4. Um, you know, watching standards being made is like, you know, watching sausage being made. You know, it's, it's uh, not the most interesting thing, but a lot of progress has been, been happening here around evolving JavaScript as a language. Um, this is not ready for you to use yet, unfortunately. Uh, it's still in the standards bodies, but a lot of, um, of movement has been happening in terms of different parties coming to a common page. So we're going to see JavaScript really evolve as a language to make it easier to work with. So you got to see a snapshot of some of, uh, of the open web, what it is, some of the cool technologies that are going on. Now, I want to leave you today with the idea to take action. If any of this looked exciting to you, if it looked important to you, if it looked uh, useful to what you're doing, I encourage you to take one of these technologies and literally today type them into Google, type them into Yahoo, um, and learn more about it. Start playing with it. See how it can fit into your own projects. And uh, please feel free to come and find me if you have any questions on these, uh, on, these, on these techniques or you want to share some cool things that you're working on using the open web. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll have time for some questions. About five minutes, I think. Um, actually, you had your hand up first. The video of this presentation? Yeah, I believe um, that they'll all be up on YouTube at some point.
but I think it can take a while to encode it. I'm not sure how folks will, will find those, but I... Yes? That's a good question. So the question is, which of these availables are available from the Google Web Toolkit? Um, I'm not as familiar with GWT. GWT uh, allows you to work with gears in a straightforward way. Um, uh, there's other interesting extensions. And at any time with GWT, you can call into JavaScript using the JSNI. So the real answer is I don't know. <laughs> so one more question. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, I, I forgot. Here's, uh, here's some great domain names. Um, Code.google.com. Always interesting things going on there. Lots of open source projects. Something called Doctype. This is an open effort to document the open web. Things like HTML5. Anyone can contribute. It's very cool. Ajaxian.com. This has kind of become the watering hole for people that are interested in the open web and Ajax. Um, and the whatwg.org. Uh, these are the folks that kicked off HTML5. It's a great place to, to learn about what's going on. So thanks. <laughs>